SpaceX just shattered every record in spaceflight history. In 2025 alone, they've already launched over 150 Falcon rockets, averaging more than 13 missions per month. Meanwhile, ULA's next-generation Vulcan has flown exactly once this year. The company that once dominated national security launches is now watching SpaceX move faster than they ever thought possible. How did the gap become this massive? What does this mean for ULA's survival? Let's dive right in. To understand how we got here, we need to go back to 2006 when United Launch Alliance was born. This wasn't a desperate merger of struggling companies. Boeing and Lockheed Martin combined their launch divisions into one powerhouse built for a single purpose, absolute reliability. ULA inherited two proven rockets, Atlas V and Delta IV, and for nearly a decade, they owned the premium launch market. Atlas V flew mission after mission without a single failure. Delta IV, heavy carried billion dollar spy satellites into the most demanding orbits. When national security was on the line, there was only one company to call. ULA charged over $100 million per launch, sometimes reaching $150 million depending on the mission. Nobody questioned the price because failure simply wasn't acceptable. That was the deal, and it worked perfectly until one company changed the entire equation. When SpaceX first entered the market, most industry veterans didn't take them seriously. Falcon 9 had early failures, and the whole idea of landing and reusing rockets seemed unrealistic. ULA executives openly questioned whether reusability even made sense. Why risk flying a used rocket when you could build a new one guaranteed to work? That logic had dominated aerospace thinking for 60 years. Then SpaceX proved everyone wrong. Boosters started landing successfully. More importantly, they started flying again. What seemed impossible became routine. Boosters weren't just flying twice. They were flying 10 times, 15 times, even 20 times. Each successful reuse drove costs down and made the economics undeniable. But SpaceX didn't stop at just saving money. They used those savings to do something even more disruptive. They started launching constantly. SpaceX transformed spaceflight from a rare, carefully orchestrated event into something that looked more like airline operations. Routine, repeatable, scalable. The company went from a handful of launches per year to dozens, then nearly a hundred. The entire industry was watching a revolution happen in real time. And for the first time in decades, ULA faced genuine competition. The government noticed. If SpaceX could launch more frequently, land boosters reliably, and charge half what ULA charged, why were taxpayers paying premium prices? SpaceX began winning national security contracts that once seemed permanently out of reach. The landscape had shifted, and ULA needed an answer fast. That answer was Vulcan Centaur. This next-generation rocket would replace both Atlas V and Delta IV. It would be more affordable, use Blue Origin's BE-4 engines instead of Russian imports, and restore ULA's competitive edge. On paper, Vulcan looked like the perfect solution. But development doesn't happen on paper. The BE-4 engine took years longer than expected to reach flight-ready status. Vulcan's first launch date slipped repeatedly. While ULA waited for engines to arrive, SpaceX kept launching. By the time Vulcan finally reached the pad, Falcon 9 had already become a fully mature system, flying at unprecedented rates. The window to catch up had already closed. Then Vulcan hit another major setback. During its second test flight in late 2024, one of the solid rocket boosters malfunctioned due to a manufacturing defect. The investigation added months to the certification timeline. Every delay meant more missions going to SpaceX instead of waiting for Vulcan. What happened earlier this year made the situation impossible to ignore. The Space Force needed to launch a critical navigation satellite. Historically, preparing this type of mission took nearly two years. After process improvements, the fastest timeline was still around five months. SpaceX did it in three months. From decision to orbit in 90 days. That's not just faster. That's a completely different operational capability. Here's the critical part. This mission was originally planned for Vulcan, but Vulcan wasn't ready, so it flew on Falcon 9 instead. The military's newest rocket lost a mission to the commercial workhorse that launches multiple times per week. 
ULA's future couldn't compete with SpaceX's present. Vulcan eventually received certification for national security missions and completed its first military launch earlier this year. But one successful flight doesn't solve the fundamental problem. Vulcan has flown exactly once in 2025. Meanwhile, most of ULA's missions are still being carried out by Atlas V, the rocket that was supposed to be retired years ago. When your future rocket sits idle while your legacy rocket does all the work, that's not a transition. That's a company stuck in neutral. ULA's stated goal is reaching two launches per month, roughly 24 per year. A few years ago, that target would have sounded ambitious and competitive. Today, it's nowhere near enough. SpaceX isn't working toward 24 launches per year. They've already surpassed 150 in 2025 alone. The numbers tell the complete story. In 2023, SpaceX completed 96 Falcon launches, making them the most active launch provider on the planet. In 2024, they pushed to 134 missions in 12 months. SpaceX alone accounted for the majority of all orbital launches from the United States. In 2025, they've already exceeded 150 Falcon launches and the year isn't even finished. They're averaging more than 13 launches per month. Some weeks see multiple launches from both coasts within hours of each other. Even if ULA somehow hit their two launches per month target tomorrow, they'd still be operating at less than one-fifth of SpaceX's current rate. The gap isn't closing, it's accelerating. But frequency is only half the story. Cost is where the situation becomes truly insurmountable. SpaceX advertises Falcon 9 launches starting around $62 to $67 million for commercial customers. Government missions add specific requirements that increase the price, but they typically remain under $100 million. Because boosters fly multiple times, SpaceX's actual internal costs are believed to be far lower than what customers pay. ULA operates on completely different economics. Atlas V costs well over $100 million per launch, sometimes approaching $150 million. Every flight uses brand new hardware built from scratch. Once that rocket launches, it's gone forever. Nothing returns. Nothing flies again. Every single mission requires manufacturing an entire new vehicle. Vulcan was designed to be more affordable than Atlas V, and it likely is. But being cheaper than Atlas V still doesn't make it competitive with Falcon 9, especially when launch rates are so low that fixed costs can't be distributed across multiple missions. ULA has mentioned future reusability concepts, possibly recovering engines someday, but those remain theoretical plans. SpaceX has been doing it operationally for years and improves with every flight. The same pattern shows up in crew transport. SpaceX's Crew Dragon carries astronauts to orbit for an estimated $55 million per seat. Previous government contracts for crew transport on other systems exceeded $80 million per seat. Lower cost, higher reliability, more frequent missions. The advantage holds across every metric. What we're watching isn't simply one company outperforming another. This is a fundamental transformation in how space access works. SpaceX has proven that reusability delivers superior results in every way that matters. Lower costs, higher flight rates, and greater operational flexibility. The traditional model of expendable rockets built for maximum reliability at any price isn't just outdated anymore. It's been completely replaced. So where does this leave ULA? The company still has contracts, still has missions planned, and Vulcan will continue flying. But the trajectory is unmistakable. When your competitor launches more than 150 times while you manage one, when their prices are half yours, when their turnaround time is measured in weeks while yours is measured in months, you're not competing anymore. You're watching from the sidelines. ULA built its reputation on being the safest choice. For decades, that was enough. But the market has moved beyond safe and predictable. Customers now want fast, affordable, and reliable all at the same time. SpaceX proved you don't have to choose between them. They delivered all three simultaneously, and they're getting better at it every single month. The space industry just witnessed one of the fastest and most complete competitive transformations in modern aerospace history. A company that didn't exist 20 years ago didn't just catch up to the established leader. 
They lapped them multiple times while the leader was still getting ready to race. This isn't just about rockets or launch numbers. It's about what happens when innovation moves faster than institutions can adapt. ULA had every advantage, government contracts, proven hardware, decades of experience. But advantages don't matter when the fundamentals change underneath you. What do you think ULA's next move should be? Can they recover or is this gap too large to close? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. If you found this breakdown valuable, hit that like button and share it with anyone who follows the space industry. And subscribe to Space Update 24 hours so you never miss our coverage of how this story continues to unfold. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. NASA just approved the most radical Mars plan ever conceived. Jared Isaacman's proposal would partner with SpaceX to build a human base on Mars by 2030 using Starship itself as the habitat. Instead of traditional construction, they're planning to convert the massive rocket into the base. Can a spacecraft really become humanity's first Martian home? Let's dive right in. The leaked proposal document reveals something called Project Olympus, a Mars discovery-based contract centered on in-situ resource utilization. Whether Olympus refers to the base name, the project itself, or a target location on Mars remains unclear. What matters is this. NASA has officially acknowledged that building a Mars base isn't science fiction anymore. It's active policy. For NASA, this represents an escape route from an impossible trap. The agency's Mars sample return mission has become a budget catastrophe, crawling forward while costs explode beyond control. China plans to return Mars samples between 2028 and 2031, potentially beating NASA despite starting years later. The traditional approach, methodical, cautious, expensive, simply can't compete with that timeline. SpaceX offers NASA something unprecedented, the ability to skip incremental steps and jump straight to a permanent presence, potentially returning tons of samples instead of a few kilograms. But SpaceX needs this partnership just as desperately. Elon Musk has been funding Starship development largely out of pocket, betting everything on making humanity multiplanetary. That's inspiring, but it's also a massive financial gamble without guaranteed returns. A formal NASA contract transforms Starship 